crossing the road and he got hit by a four wheel drive with a full bull bar. So that was a thing that changed our life, you know, one split second. I just didn't expect anything so horrific. I just thought broken arm or a leg. Or surgery and they were after surgery, which was about one o'clock in the morning, they came out and said, look, uh, we've had to remove a lot of brain tissue and take away bits of bone and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and look, the outlook is if, if he recovers, he'll be a veggie. So, you know, just sort of be prepared to sort of put him in an institution and forget about him if you can get on with your lives more. John was the youngest of three children. They were a typical middle-class family living in Sydney. Each day he survived. He was on a ventilator, of course, in deep coma. And they sort of, they give them medication, obviously, to stop the brain swelling. When we first uh, you know, discovered that John was going to be brain injured, there was nothing offered. You know, we were basically stuck in Westmead. We stayed there for six months, and then uh, after that. They, we sort of said where to, they wanted to get us out because you can only stay so long in private public hospitals. And we had no idea. And they said, well, maybe we might be able to get him into, uh, there's a place called B4B at Lidcombe, which was part of the old men's home there. Bruce and Annette purchased this home in Sydney, which was adapted to accommodate John's physical needs hallways into John's bathroom was made wider, the hallway into his bedroom was made wider. John's, John's level of disability is such that he can do very little personal care himself. Uh, he needs to be toileted, which means that we have to give him a, an enema every sort of every morning just to stimulate him so he goes. He, he needs to be, he want to obviously clean him up, shower him, clean his teeth for him, dry him all the rest. Uh, and then dress him. He can't really dress himself. Uh, so you really got to do the, all the, and that entails a fair bit of lifting and transferring, obviously, from shower chairs to beds and all that sort of thing. And probably that's the heaviest part of the day, getting John up and dressed and away. We did start up to the physical load of, of doing it. I did. <laughs> In the early days, as we obviously did a lot more yes. ourselves. But uh, and, and in the early days, I was at work, and so Annette needed help. Uh, but now, you know, she can't do the heavy lifting like she used to her back, and that is, is playing up. And, and I just, I'm just getting too too tired myself to to, to do it. You know, I, I I don't I can do personal care on the weekends, but I don't attempt to do therapy. All my back would would pack up too. You know. And I'm reasonably strong for my age, but I'm sort of, I do get tired <laughs> pretty quickly <Like> now. <laughs> The, the personal care part. Uh, I don't attempt to do any therapy. I decided I'm getting too old to do the extra lifting involved there. Uh, on Saturdays, uh, we, we he goes out to, to a respite all day on Saturday from nine till nine till four, and so I have him ready for a taxi that comes and picks him up at nine o'clock, and takes him off, and then he comes back after after the four o'clock finish. Sundays, he's here all day, and I do personal care and then. He basically goes and sits in his comfortable chair and watches telly and family conversations and visitors and you know, so all, you know. Yeah. And that's essentially John's life. You know. yeah. Bruce and Annette have been caring for John for the last 28 years in their home. Due to the nature of John's accident, he can do very little for himself. John is totally reliant on his parents for even the simplest things. To make a phone call, to visit friends, for his entire connection with the outside world. Family after John's accident, more or less. Mm. She said, we had no family much after John's accident because you and Mum were doing mm. tag teams to go and spend time with John. And in other words, they felt neglected. No uh, look, I'm 69 and Annette's a couple of months um, uh, behind There's five me. months between us. We'll both be 70 next year. So, um, it's, you know. And we're starting to slow down. The sharp Mimo writer. And it was just made for businessmen to make a short note to the secretary or something. And if John typed, it would come on the screen. And then he'd push the button and out would come the message. And he could tear it off and give to the person. One time, 
Um, he was using it at the airport. We were seeing his father off overseas and um, some children were staring at him and um, he typed out on here because he couldn't talk and he gave them the note and it said, I'm not as silly as I look. <laughs> finally collapsed and we could never ever find a really good replacement for it. it the blind nice school have got, sorry, the uh, spastic centre got some little printers but we tried them here and they didn't really sort of work as well with, I tried the, uh, the laptop, this sort of was my sort of starting point. First of all, we had the computer and uh, he could type letters but it wasn't, it never proved to be what I thought it might be because I was hoping that he'd have something when friends came around, he could talk and converse with them and be part of the conversation, which he tends not to be too, because you know, you know what he's like talking he knows what he's trying to say, but it's very hard for us to understand. So then he resorts to the letterboard, and that gets painfully slow. For the majority of the last 28 years, John has been using this QWERTY letterboard, pointing to every letter of every word he wishes to communicate. If you're hungry, up here you just go. I'm hungry. And that tells you carer. But you're hungry, and then you can say, <laughs> Well, he's hungry. Do you want a tomato, please? <laughs> Broccoli, please? <laughs> a carrot, please? What do you think? Tell us. Oh, I want a snack. Popcorn, <laughs> please? <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Just see the way his eyes lit up when... Uh, it, it got, and I don't think it was just the words that it was being said, it was like the realisation, like you could see a road on it. We yeah. are an Australian uh, charity that support people that fall within three areas of interest, chairs, children and community. And uh, Camp Breakaway falls within all those three areas, so we're thrilled to be able to give ongoing support to uh, Camp Breakaway. Yep. Olivia from Network of Caring generously donated an iPad to John. Accepting the iPad is Breakaway's fundraising manager, Jody Davis. The phone he said, I'll check this photo out, and we sent it through and emailed it through as it, as it came through. And Jody rang me the next day and she said, I just can't get that photograph out of my mind. Mm. From there, obviously, the connection was to you, and then mm. and to you, and you were moved to, you know, to, to give it, and here we are today, about to go and take it to him. Mm. You know, this is about to change somebody's life. Yeah, yeah, mm. that's great. Mm. <laughs> I always like iPad, but for someone like John to use it, it's even better. I think, yeah. Can you imagine so how beautiful. frustrating it would be to point yeah. to every letter yeah. of every word? It's just. just Honestly, I was blown away when I saw him down at the adventure trail. Yeah. I just thought, I just that photo that Cordelia took, it just it haunted me. Like I watched it that yeah. night and I couldn't sleep. I thought it just there's gotta be some I better kept method it was of like being stuck in a Morse code world. Where yeah. Everything's like a letter. You know? yeah. 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 Wow. You're pointing at letters, it's just you may give up and or why bother tell the carer what I need. It takes, yeah. it just takes forever. But with an iPad you yeah. can express more what they need. Yeah. So John, on behalf of a wonderful organisation called Network of Caring, a lovely man called Ian and a lovely lady called Olivia, this is for you. Our absolute pleasure. So he could even type out an email to his sister. Right, right. And email send it, it send to it, her. Send it. Let's have pizza. <laughs> I want to go home. <laughs> Big sook. You, <laughs> you probably thought that was a restaurant, did you? But it's going to take a little bit of practice. You need to experiment whether you need it flat or whether you need to sit it upright. I, th I reckon if you can sit it upright, yes. you're going to go better because you're not going to have that part of your hand. Touching on the letters. <laughs> he just likes the company. <laughs> you want to do your head like this? <laughs> Go.
Go on, get me the jump. <laughs> Not too bad. Hey, she did see. I might break the iPad. I've been for a jump. What did he say? I'm hungry. <laughs> How would you describe his progress, Bruce? I think it was a little slower than what I'd anticipated. Uh, possibly due to John hasn't been quite as alert lately as he may have been. Um, I think there are some challenges with the touch screen that I hadn't appreciated, whereas whether he was using a pad, it was he could he could hit a key and, and it didn't matter what the rest of his hand was doing and there was no and that's something that either he's got to learn or we've got to work our way around that it's a very sensitive screen so you've got to be more precise about where you put your finger and, and the amount of pressure you use those sorts of things but it's got great potential remember remember where you've got to just touch it if you can just i know it's a little little difficult Among other things, John's fine motor skills and vision were affected as a result of the accident. This makes coordination and movement on the iPad difficult. However, John is striving to overcome these obstacles. Got to feel like that. Now when you press it like that, it'll open. But when you press it like that, it won't do anything. Yeah? So John, after you've typed your message, if you press this button up here, can you press this one right at the top? It actually speaks what you just typed. So press this one. Which one am I using to type with? I was left hand but now. I am ambidextrous. That we've just discovered is it needs to be pretty much on a 45 degree angle from John's hand, so it keeps it, it keeps his knuckles out of the way and allows him to point with the pen and the tip of his finger, and also to have both of those pillows under his arm. Otherwise, he's holding the full weight of his arm all yeah, the time, time. And, and it drags on it the screen. Wear, it wears yeah. him down and it and then he's more likely to, to right. brush his knuckles against the screen. And get so, tired doing it. Yeah, yeah, get very tired. Yeah. And you know, and it becomes a chore then. It's not it's not fun anymore. Which one am I using to type with? I was left hand but now I am ambidextrous. Yeah, okay. Yes. It's good effort. Do you know what he's trying to say? Yeah, absolutely you can tell and, and even with typos you can tell yeah. exactly what he's trying to say. There's a button there that obviously speaks it in the end if that's what he wants to do, or he can sit here and mm. write a book, mm. write a movie script, okay. you know, anything that you like. There are a wide range of apps available for people with disabilities and communication difficulties. But it, there's some great little applications though, we can see mm -hmm. that. You know. Bruce and Annette are continuing to encourage John to explore the iPad's capabilities. Having realised the possibilities of the iPad, this project has generated interest from people and organisations involved in disability care. As Breakaway expands this project, we encourage you to become involved by making a donation, corporate sponsorship or volunteering.